is a smart city. Uh, there are a lot of definitions, but let's use a short one, which is it's a city that learns from the information it collects using 21st century technology. So you're talking GPS, mobile phones, sensors, uh, the cloud, uh, broadband, social media, all of that mixing together in some fashion to learn what's going on and improve what happens. So then the second key to this is you've got to engage citizens in this in terms of people designing it. Otherwise, you just bring a technology in, put it in place, and there's a fair amount of resistance we we'll talk a little more about what happens there. But think of this, a firm called ShotSpotter. Anyone know what ShotSpotter is? So, sh Shot, yes, okay, good. So ShotSpotter acoustically identifies where a gunshot happens. All right, so th think of in New York, they're using ShotSpotter, and here's the, what's happened. In the past, of every 10 gunshots, they investigated one, the one that ended up being an injury, a robbery, or a violent act. The other nine, they kind of just blew off. Now they go look at all 10, find out why to shoot, what were you doing, what was up. A West Coast city, racked with crime, and one of the big cities with in a lot of trouble, I won't name it, but that city thinks they know that the shooters in that city are less than 20 to 40 people. Out of a half million people, 40 people are the troublemakers. So now you begin to focus down on those 40 we need to deal with. The rest of you, you're okay. So see the difference that data, sensors, information makes in how a city works. This goes on, we had Johnson & Johnson with us last week talking about mental health and suicide prevention using social media, a smart city application. Uh, New York City just installed wireless water meters, 50% reduction in consumer complaints. That's nice, but the bigger thing is most cities in the world, if you track water coming in and going out, 70% disappears and they have no idea where it goes. If you put sensors in, you start to find out. Is it being stolen? Is it just falling into the earth? Is it being whatever? They don't know. India would change dramatically its relationship to its people if it could solve the water problem using those sensors. A paperless government. We have GovLab in town here, but think of what uh, all this is gonna do in terms of shorter permitting time, online permitting, getting business done. I'll go talk a little more about that later, too. Uh, there's a company in the Brooklyn Navy Yard does echo ergoskeletons. So basically, Iron Man for workers. So you have some of those issues. Injuries in workforce, they designed this so that you don't get injured lifting up a heavy parcel or a package. So that's, a again, in my view, a smart city application. We could go down the list. An innovation lab in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, inventing new things. Uh, Watson and IBM, did you notice what they did? They bought Weather Channel. Why'd they buy Weather Channel? Because they think Watson can predict weather events more precisely than anything else. They're starting to do micro weather because you're a retailer and they're gonna tell you that it's gonna rain tomorrow at 10 o'clock and you ought to change what you sell tomorrow. It's gonna show up in how you do world trade too because you're gonna be able to track storms, events, trends related to weather much more precisely. There's smart street lights. Okay, you save power because they're LED, but what you also do is you begin to get, if you've got the right sensors in it, a video record of what happened. So if there's a fender bender, no longer is there an issue of, well, what really happened? You got a video record of it. Or maybe it's an issue of security and you're worried about what's happening on your street. So smart street lights are showing up and then finally, think of autonomous vehicles, driverless cars, and what that's gonna to mean to the design of cities. We're already, for instance, if, everyone, if everything is more of a car moving about being shared, parking changes in all the building design. You start to take out the parking levels, turn it into commercial space. So there's a change, you can see these things just stacking up to make a change in how cities work. Now, why did we pick cities versus other places to work? Well, here's some of the stats. Currently, 54% of humanity lives in cities, but close to 80% of the world's economic production occurs in cities. So these are the engines where things happen. Second, 2.5 billion people are predicted to move to cities in the next 30 years, by 2050. So we go basically up to where 70% of the world lives in cities. So it's where the action is. 
Trade is integral to smart cities. In India, they're building 100 smart cities. 40 of those cities are port cities. So the smart is not going to just be driverless cars. It's going to be what you do. How did the goods come in? How did the goods move? We were talking to Daimler last week, uh, Mercedes's head company, and they're already thinking of transportation this way, as in horizontal and vertical. Well, what's vertical? You come, into, you come off from where you come in, cross the city, and begin to download to a truck, to a van, to, in their view, maybe a drone. The drone takes you up to the 40th floor, parks the goods. We can't do that right now because buildings aren't built that way, but they're thinking about where that heads. So you can see how that's going to affect trade. Uh, finally, Bank of America predicts that uh, smart city as a sector will turn into about a $1.6 trillion business by 2020. It's three years from now. So this is a huge growth area with a lot of opportunity. Never again, uh, for at least for 100 years, will this transformation of cities take place. So think about this. Whatever we do in the next 20 years, that will be repeated because that will use up the capital and form those cities. And that's the cities your grandchildren, their grandchildren are going to live in for the next 100 years. If you do it well, you should have a pretty good century or two. You do it poorly, you've got a world basically that's living in congestion, dirty air, uninnovative, and as an undersecretary of the Navy, to me that means too many wars. So we pick cities because this is where you excuse me, make this great change. Now, not everything's rosy in this world. You can, I'm sure you're thinking already. All this data, what about my privacy? Clearly an issue. Need to settle that. Secondly, all this data and information, what about cybersecurity? Uh, what happens? Think of it today. You worry about your credit card. Maybe you worry about your identity being stolen. When you're in a driverless car, you're going to worry about someone hacking into that car's information system, and you're toast. Uh, if you're getting an insulin drip from a chip in your body, and someone hacks into the insulin chip, you're toast. So cybersecurity moves way up the ladder in terms of its importance in your life. So that's got to be solved. Up close, mayors keep asking us, you know, what do I do first? How do I do it? How do I pay for it? Developers are asking where they get the return on investment. But Hudson Yards, just across the way on top of the railroad tracks here, is a fully informated smart city complex. We teamed up with NYU. They're collecting all the data and they're running the buildings a whole different way because of data. So it's happening. Workers are a little worried. There's a lot of job threat in this. This is taking jobs that are repetitive and often we call the base of blue collar life turning them into robots. So we've got a real issue where workers go. Uh, citizens want to be sure it helps their quality of life. Interestingly, S Smart Dubai was here last week, headed by a really uh, vivacious, intelligent woman. And they're trying to build the world's smartest city with the happiest citizens. That's quite an order. But that's what Dubai is doing, and they have the money to do it. And now they're collecting the intelligence and talent to do it. It's pretty exciting. Let's watch what they do. Uh, in the United States, I think that uh, we are the uh, best hope to uh, essentially take on what may be a dropping out of the federal government's interest in all of these programs. So we're looking to mayors to be the ones who provide the energy, the ideas, and the solutions. Last week, we had mayors from around America talking about that very thing. So in Britain, the economist reports that uh, politicians would rather be mayors than members of parliament. It's a good sign. Uh, in India, Michael Bloomberg went over and the Prime Minister Modi said, I want to have 100 smart cities. Michael Bloomberg had a nice idea. He said, rather than top down, you just define what to do. Why don't you compete amongst all the cities of India and pick the top 100 solutions? So he did. They did. And out of it, they got, instead of one solution, they got 100 solutions, which they're implementing across India now. India's way, uh, moving faster than the U.S. So one reason we're doing this is to get the U.S. cities in this game. China's interesting. We think of China more often as a top-down society, and here's how it ought to be done. 
So that doesn't work out quite that way because each mayor is faced with a unique set of issues of, well, what am I going to do in my city? And here's what's happening. Mayors want to attract talent and keep talent because that's the secret to a vital city because that's where all the innovation, the growth, the opportunity comes from. Well, talent will not live for a long time in a polluted or congested or unfriendly housing city. So these mayors are in a competition to say, I have the best city for you to live in. And you can see that taking place. Cities like Shanghai and others saying, we'll make you a fully formed, complete, exciting person. Well, that race to the top, pretty interesting in China where we would say it's all a one solution country, it's not. So think of what's going on from India, competitions, China, race to the top. This is pretty powerful. The UN recognized it. We now have a sustainable development goal, number 11. It says cities got to be better. Let's see if that happens. Habitat 3, met in Ecuador, created an agenda for smart cities. Uh, the Trump administration says they're going to do a trillion dollars of infrastructure almost certainly going to be in cities, and most likely a good bit of it will be smart because the future economy rides much more on smart and all that I talked about than it does on traditional industrial uh, tech. Use and News World Report is going to create a metric for maker cities so that cities around the world compete for how good they are. Steve Ballmer, former CEO of uh, Microsoft created something called USA Facts, in which he's putting all the data about America's governments, including their cities, into one big database, and then having, if, trying to get cities to issue a 10K that says, I took in this much money, I spent this much money, most important, here's what I accomplished. So get some accountability in these cities along the lines I described. So that's, my view, pretty strong evidence that something's going on in cities. Now, a little bit about why, at a more fundamental level, I think this is important. First, as Undersecretary of the Navy, I got to see the world and travel the world and begin to understand that, first, we have a great military system. And if you want to have, uh, let's call it what we call kinetic power, the use of force to keep the world stable, we are very good at that. But it would be a lot better if the world basically liked to be stable got along with each other and had these great cities. So my view is to make America's defense life easier, let's build cities that people like to live in so that leaders don't gin up a war or decide they need an enemy to stay in power. They basically say, I deliver high quality of life. That's one. Two, with nine billion people moving into cities or on the earth by 2050, the current operating system doesn't work. You have too much waste, too few resources, and maldistribution of those resources. So without some kind of technological fix on how we use resources, we have a problem by 2050. Cities are probably the best place to do that fix. You've got people that are innovative, you've got technology being applied, those two fit together. You've got the hope of a world by 2050 that works. The third, Cities are where innovation occurs. This is where more and more young people want to be here. Major corporations want to set up in suburban New Jersey. The young kids say basically, I won't work there. I will work in Manhattan. They want to be where the action is, where the life is. So cities are a great place for us to innovate. Now, it's not just cities, but it's also world trade. I want to talk about two things that I should be on your mind certainly on mine, about world trade. First, uh, automation, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology are going to transform how government and business works in every industry, including yours. I'm leading a study at the Pentagon for the Secretary of Defense on how to use these technologies, automation, robotics, etc., to do the business processes of the Pentagon, not the war fighting, that's another study, but the business processes, we spent about $300 billion on those processes, HR, finance, logistics, procurement. The industry's evidence says that you reduce cost by 30%, you speed the decision by a times of 100, six weeks down to 10 minutes on decision making, you change a lot of the workforce, 
This is a powerful f a force. So you do this in the Pentagon, big savings. It's going to show up in your tr industry too. Who's been reading about blockchain and basically the whole letter of credit sequence of bill of ladings, et cetera? All that goes into blockchain and a lot of things you do now, done by a computer. So I would, there's a blockchain symposium on the schedule, May 15th. I'd be sure someone goes to it because it's going to be a job eater and a company eater in the next 10 years. Uh, out of this, secondly, is industry is going to change. Manufacturing is going to change. I was just with the Prime Minister of Malaysia who wanted to study Industry 4.0. Who knows what Industry 4.0 is? So what well, Industry 4.0 basically is using these technologies automation, robots, artificial intelligence data, to manufacture things, do it better. So here's what's going on. Malaysia rises up well in terms of development. It's now, I think, $23,000 a year annual income. So they're on the way to being a developed country. They did it through labor arbitrage, right? Labor was cheaper in Malaysia than the U.S. Manufacturing moves to Malaysia. Powerful force, China powerful force. But now, a robot in the U.S. and a robot in Malaysia costs about the same price. So suddenly that labor arbitrage, it looks like this, and Malaysia looks like the cheap place to do business, goes away. And the U.S. looks just the same. So someone's manufacturing in India, 300 people to produce what they needed. Moved back to Alabama, producing everything they need, 24 people. So 300 to 24, you're going to see that shift take place because those numbers are way beyond political forces. Those numbers are economic so deep, the trade changes. So you've got an issue of why are goods moving from China, Africa might be walking up this ladder. Now this ladder is going to be very hard to walk up. There's a big shift in global trade about to happen to Industry 4.0. So it would be worth watching and deciding where you play in this future market. So for all these reasons, I think it's worth watching where smart cities go because where smart cities go is where world trade will also go. These technologies are powerful. Human beings are inventing them daily. Young kids are walking into the office, knocking on the door day after day. I want to join your company. I want to do something around the world. So this is a powerful force. It's going to affect trade. It's going to affect the cities we live in. It could be very good if we do it well. Let's hope we do it well. So with that, think of it. The future will change dramatically. Much of it in the long run will be good. We should all live better. In the short run, it's going to be painful. A lot of job loss, a lot of job transition, a lot of company transition. Second, not all this urban technology is ready for prime time. There's a, we got 10 years, 15 years of working out how these all work the best, but the process is underway. And third, cities are the best hope around the world for the innovative change that's got to take place for 2050 to work. You can pick 2050, you pick 2045, it doesn't matter. Someplace out there, things get pretty brutal unless we change how we operate the world. So for all those reasons, thanks for having me. It's a bright, strong future if we do it right. So do it right with me. Help me make cities better. Help me uh, work with you on world trade, and we'll see you in, what do you say, 10 years, and we'll see what's happened. Thank you.